We are delighted to be joined by the author of a brand new book, Hoping for Happiness, Barnabas Piper. Hello and welcome to Exposit the Word, Barnabas. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm excited to be on with you. Oh, thank you. Barnabas, this is not your first book. At what point do we start to call you a prolific author? Uh, I don't I don't know is there a, is there a specific number that defines prolific or is it like the frequency you release them it's my fourth book so I think you probably have to get to like eight or ten yeah. before you're prolific so what can we call you now what's what's for what's uh just an author just, a... just, <laughs> yeah. just an author just an awesome author okay well we'll go with that well I... I'll settle for awesome. Yes, that's uh, that's acceptable. <laughs> yeah. Before we talk about your new book, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, a little bit about myself. That is, I'll try not to tell you a lot of bit about myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, I am married. I have two daughters. I uh, live in the Nashville, Tennessee area. Um, I serve on staff at Emanuel Nashville, um, overseeing our small groups and discipleship groups and just general church community. Um, I am apparently an awesome author, although I would have just said I am an author. <laughs> yeah. Um, I write in, I, I write for a couple different websites. There's one called He Reads Truth yeah. that, uh, they, they put out these Bible reading plans with daily devotional reflections. And so I contribute to that. Uh, it's a great site. Uh, I co-host a podcast called the happy rant. Um, that's a little bit about myself. Uh, yeah. background wise, I grew up. I grew up uh, in a pastor's family. My dad is John Piper, for those who may know that name. And so being a pastor's kid was a very influential part of my life, both in terms of my relationship with the Lord and my relationship with the church, both for better and worse. There was yeah. some great positives and some significant challenges that came out of that. Yeah. Um, and so I've been I've been a believer since I was a child, but I've been through some significant ups and downs of, of faith and doubts and and some struggles mm. along the way, uh, all of which is, is kind of fed into the writing. So that's that's a little bit about where I am now and a little bit about where I've come from. So can you specifically remember when you became a Christian and also you touched upon it, you know, being John Piper's son? What was it like being a pastor's kid and especially John Piper's kid? <laughs> yeah, I I do remember. I remember when I made the the kind of outward decision to follow the Lord. And I was probably about six or seven years old. Yeah. Uh, I remember going into my dad's office. He he had a home office that he did a lot of his work from, and you know we were generally welcome to come and go as kids as long as we didn't inter interrupt too often. Yeah. And uh, so I just I remember going in and uh, sitting down on his lap and talking through what it means to be a Christian and then praying a, a prayer of, you know, giving my life to Christ, professing that, and then writing out kind of writing that prayer out in the front blank page of my, my children's Bible, yeah. which I think my dad still has that page and that cover. Yeah. Um, the Bible has long since disintegrated because it was, you know, it was an inexpensive one, yeah. but, uh, but still has that keepsake somewhere. So from that point on, um, I, you know, I've been a professing believer. I think like anybody who professes faith really young, there's a lot of growth that happens as you grow into maturity and faith and mm -hmm. discover what your blind spots are. Yeah. And then for me, and this was a lot of one of the difficulties of being a pastor's kid, learning what it is to have a genuine personal relationship with Christ, not a, a borrowed faith, mm -hmm. something that's just been handed to me. Uh, by my parents, because my parents were very faithful in their their Bible teaching, very consistent in their lifestyle, yeah. um, just just honorable, godly people, and also very theologically, um, they, they had a very filled out theology, which means I was handed a lot of things that I had never thought through. Mm -hmm. And so as I as I grew and learned, uh, especially into adulthood, had to really learn and figure out, and some of it through through my own dumb decisions and failures, uh, what it meant for me to be a Christian, not for me to have John Piper's faith or Noel yeah. Piper's faith. Yeah. Um, in terms of being a pastor's kid, that was, that was actually the first book I ever wrote was called the pastor's kid yeah. and kind of laid some of this out, but the, let's start with the good side of it. Yeah. Um, the good sides of it were that, like I said, my, my parents were very faithful and very consistent. I didn't have some of the issues that some pastor's kids do with 
uh, a father who's one way in public and another way in private, mm-hmm. sort of a, there's the, there's the, the pulpit face and then the home face. Yeah. My dad is, is morally, theologically, biblically consistent. Mm-hmm. And, and that led to, it just, it led me to have a, have a much deeper understanding of what it means to follow Jesus faithfully because yeah. he, he lived out what he taught yeah. and still does. Yeah. Um, I had a deep love for the church. The church was very much like a family to me growing up because when I was born, my dad had already been a pastor for a few years, and the church wasn't very, very big at that point. It was maybe 300 or 400 people, which yeah. at least by American standards is not a very large church. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, and so it it was the kind of thing where you, you could know most of the people in the church. It could feel very, very close-knit, and that continued up through my – my high school years, my closest friends were from church. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and and I was just talking to a friend about this a couple of days ago, just mm-hmm. realizing what, how how much it was baked into the rhythm of my life that church is a foundational thing. Mm-hmm. We just, I even once I moved away from home, it never really, it never really was an option for me in my own mind and in my own conscience to just give up on going to church yeah. because it was just something that I go, Oh, this is, this is vital. This is part of life. This is part of a genuine Christian life as well as just a healthy life. And so, and so that, that was all kind of part of the good aspect of being a pastor's kid. Mm -hmm. The negative aspects were some of what I touched on earlier, struggling to figure out what it, what is it that I believe versus what is it that I've been told to believe? Yeah. Um, struggling to deal with other people's expectations for me. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a sense that pastor's kids are supposed to be, uh, they have to have a deeper understanding of the Bible, have to be better behaved, which I was absolutely not. I was not better behaved mm-hmm. than anybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, I still struggle with being well behaved. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, and just, so just sort of the, the idea that I'm supposed to be what they expect me to be instead of we're all functioning under the single standard of, honor Jesus with your life. Yeah. And so that, you know, it seemed like there was a second standard there. Um, and then there's just the, the, the pressure of being under observation. Yeah. Yeah. The the pastor's family is just really well known. And so, uh, after a while, and and then that was exacerbated for me because as I grew older, my dad became more and more well known in the, in the Christian community. And so the idea that just eyes are on you all the time, there's not room to make mistakes. There's not room to, to have doubts. There's, um, you have to please people. Mm. And so that all, that all kind of creates this, this very pressurized context for a lot of pastors, kids Mm. and definitely did for me. Yeah. Was there this kind of expectation where, you know, as a young person, you was almost expected to be like a theologian where people would come up and ask you these really complicated questions beyond your years and you'd be expected to know the answer. Um, it was, it was kind of a mixed bag. Yeah. I didn't. I don't recall too many times where that happened. I do recall where people, and people still do this now, which yeah. it amuses me more now than it annoys <laughs> me. But they will ask me about things that my father has said, yeah. yeah, and they will ask my opinion on it. You know, your dad said this about, yeah, I don't know, the end times or Calvinism or something. Yeah. Yeah. And what do I think about it? And frankly, I I don't pay that close of attention to what my dad says publicly. Yeah. Um. And um. And so. There's that aspect where I kind of get put on the spot, like I'm, I'm supposed to speak into his sermon points or yeah. his books or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But then the flip side of it is, I have an ego, just yeah. like anybody does, yeah. and so if I have the chance to sound smart yeah. or to sound like I have expertise or to sound like I know, it's hard not to st- to give an answer. Yeah. So I remember, you know, being in 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 church classes growing up as a child and then as a teenager. And there was a lot of gratification in knowing the right answers, yeah, you yeah. know, kind of being the smartest kid in the room, yeah. which nobody likes the smartest kid in the room, yeah. but that, yeah. that was still, it was so, <laughs> so it's this sort of two edged sword where on the yeah. one hand, I hate those questions because it's kind of putting me on the spot, speaking into something I either don't know about or don't care about. And then on the other hand, I, I love to give good answers. I yeah. love to be the smart guy yeah. in, in sort of a, you know, a selfishly ego, yeah. ego driven way. Yeah. So it, it's a it's not a positive thing either way but there's there's sort of a push and pull there yeah so your new book hoping for happiness how did you come to write it and give us an overview of what it's all about I came to write it by 
it, it kind of all of my books come from there, there's usually there's usually sort of two aspects yeah. one is what i observe in the world and uh you know just looking around and going that that doesn't seem to mesh with what i understand to be mm. true or what i understand reality to be yeah um and then the other side is my own personal experience so what am i bringing into this how have i how have i grown in in understanding of this so the book is about basically answering the questions what is what does happiness look like in this life and both by observation and by my experience i kind of saw two extreme sides of things on the one hand there was the context i grew up in the conservative christian background Mm -hmm. where happiness is something people are often very suspicious of Mm -hmm. it's um happiness is viewed as as worldly or as trite it might just be a waste of time you know so that the pursuit of happiness is seen as it's just kind of a a vapid meaningless waste of time and and possibly even like full of temptation it's yeah. happiness and temptation go hand in hand it's kind of opposed to holiness yeah. in the way that a lot of people think there's a yeah. lot of talk about joy there's a lot of talk about joy in the lord joy in eternal reality which all of which i believe in but that's set in juxtaposition to happiness so joy is something meaningful and happiness is something trite so Mm. i came out of that background and i and i i really wrestled with that growing up because i always thought well if happiness is so bad why did god make beautiful autumn days why did god make bacon why did god make music (laughs) yeah these are things that make us happy yeah what do we do but so what do we do with that then on the flip side, you look around at just generally how the world approaches happiness, and it's just this this manic pursuit of the next pleasure, mm. this 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 chasing of so you get a you get a good job, and shortly thereafter you start thinking about the next promotion yeah. or starting your own business or yeah. kind of the next yeah. thing. There's always there's always a chasing and a pursuit. Yeah which I've definitely gotten caught up in in the past and it's it's exhausting mm. and I don't think that's what God has intended for us either so um, that the book is seeking to go well if the conservative Christian view of happiness as as something to be suspicious of and the worldly understanding of happiness as this sort of this crazy pursuit if both of those are wrong what's right and I, I think the Bible has a lot to say about it, especially the book of Ecclesiastes, which is where I kind of went back to over and over again throughout the book. But yeah. um, so I came to it from my own experience of going through very hard times, finding happiness in these good gifts that God has given, and then also just observing how other people approach happiness or are driven by it, afraid of mm-hmm. it, whatever, and trying mm-hmm. to trying to just bring a realistic biblical set of expectations to say, what does happiness look like in a world that is so messed up? Mm. You know, it's Genesis three talks about the fall. We're in the middle of a global pandemic right now. The American political scene is an abject disaster. So the world is a mess. Yeah. But God has given us good gifts. Yeah. And someday we go to heaven if we're a believer. Like there's this, there's this array of realities of what does happiness look like in the midst of all that? Does God care about our happiness? I think he does. Um, I I think, I, I mean, I wrote in the book very definitively that God wants us to be happy. Mm. Um, but it's happy on the terms that he defines, not how we would define it necessarily. Mm. So mm. saying that God wants us to be happy is not saying that God will give you everything you ask for. Yeah. But yeah. rather that in the same way that a good father gives good gifts to his children and then takes joy in their enjoyment so i have two daughters and you know watching them open presents on christmas morning gives me joy because their eyes light up and they're gleeful and they're thankful and then they go you know they go put on their new clothes or they go play with their new toys or read their new books yeah and you know i see them reading a book that i gave them and just absorbed in it and i think that's wonderful because that's exactly what I wanted out of that gift that I gave them. I wanted their enjoyment. So I think that God wants us to be happy. I also think that when God created the world, he created the world just chock full of magnificent things Mm -hmm. and sin mucked a lot of that up. Mm -hmm. 
but the good things are still good things. All the good stuff in the world didn't go away just because Adam and Eve ate the fruit. And so there's still enjoyment to be had as long as we're expecting the right things of the gifts that God gives us. Yeah. Does God control our happiness? What do you mean by that? So we know that God is sovereign, right? So the provider of all good things. How do we kind of balance our happiness and our unhappiness, I guess, with a sovereign God? That, yeah, that is a hard question. I think any, I think dealing in the realm of God's sovereignty always <laughs> just sort of walks us into a realm of, of mystery to yeah. a degree. Yeah. Just because there, there are there are aspects of it that are beyond our comprehension. Yeah. I mean, I do believe wholeheartedly that God is sovereign over all. And he himself says in his word that, you know, he brings calamity and he brings joy. You know, there's this yeah, yeah. there's this there's this dual aspect of things where God God is responsible for all in one sense. So in one sense, he he does. He's absolutely sovereign over our happiness. In another sense, happiness is a response to him that we are responsible for. Yeah. Uh, in the same way that we, you know we're we're responsible to respond with obedience to a command, mm. we are responsible for responding with happiness to the pleasures that he has provided us. Yeah. You know to 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 respond appropriately to the gifts that he's given us, and I think that should be happiness. So there's in, in relationships, in worship, in food, in drink, in music, in the arts, in yeah, you know yeah. nature, just there's, there's you could go on and on and on. If we go through life and never kind of feel the the welling up of happiness and wonder at mm. these good things, mm. I think I think we are we are disobeying God in a sense. Mm. We're not responding appropriately. So he he is sovereign, but also we are responsible for our responses in happiness to the pleasures and the good gifts that he's given. Yeah. Does God use unhappiness as a way to draw people towards him? Oh, absolutely. I think I think that absolutely he does. Now, of course, the human predilection is to is to pursue a fulfillment of our unhappiness or, or a solving of our unhappiness anywhere except God, mm, yeah. you know, so yeah. we're going to turn to, we're going to turn to self. We're going to turn to people. We're going to turn to uh, anything besides God first. Mm. But I, I think so. I, I think you see it in, I think every unhappiness is an indication that we should be turning to God in yeah. some way, shape, or form. Yeah. You know, if you wake up in the morning, or if I wake up in the morning, and we're just in a foul mood, which, I don't know if that, that might never happen for you. It happens <laughs> with unreasonable frequency for me. Yeah, yeah. That ought to be an indication to me that I need to turn for enjoyment. Yeah. Well, first, I probably need to do some repenting to yeah. some degree. Yeah. But with some enjoyment to to quiet, to coffee, to reading, to these things that God has put in my life to to solve those in gratitude. And mm. when we have gratitude for those gifts, we, we are thinking towards God. So it is a, a, a turning towards him. And that's just a minor thing. Mm. I think God uses unhappiness to show people the void in their life that he needs to fill. Yeah. And I think, you know, when people pursue earthly happiness— over and over and over and over again with without success mm. at some point i think god just sits there and goes i'm giving you all the hints yeah it's me it's me i'm gonna the only way you're gonna find happiness is by turning to me yeah and so yeah i think i think he uses unhappiness to to pull people to himself yeah so good building on that question is being unsaved and happy dangerous i mean being unsaved is dangerous period <laughs> yeah i think an unhappy unbeliever is probably, uh, in some sense, closer to the truth of, of salvation than a happy one. Yeah. I think one of the most difficult things to do as a believer is convince a content yeah. non-Christian that yeah. they have a need. Yeah. Um, whereas an, a non-Christian whose life is falling apart, who's just miserable, who looks at themselves in the mirror and goes, I just, I don't like my life. Yeah. I don't like where this has gone. 
there's a there's an opening in their life for the gospel. So I think there is there's danger for anybody who's not a believer. There's pronounced danger for somebody who's satisfied as a mm, non-believer. Yeah. What does biblical happiness look like? Well, let me say let me start by saying what it doesn't look like mm. just to kind of to, to to paint the backdrop a little bit. Mm. Um biblical happiness is not um it it's it's not the kind of happiness that people are suspicious of. So mm. when I mentioned earlier conservative Christians being suspicious of happiness, usually what they have done is looked at kind of a, a sinful worldly idolatry and said, well, that's happiness and that's wrong. And they're correct. It is wrong. Idolatry is, is wrong. So biblical happiness is not idolatry. Mm. It's not finding our identity or our meaning or our deepest fulfillment in anything temporal yeah in anything that goes away yeah it is relishing all of the delicious beautiful magnificent good things that god has created the way they were intended to be enjoyed Mm -hmm. so when it, it is it's contentment contentment with what god has given us it's looking for the good in our relationships and in our churches and in our, you know, just it's all the substance of our lives. Um, and ultimately, it's just recognizing that every single um, experience we have in life is not is not ultimate. Yeah, that's I mean, Ecclesi- that when Ecclesiastes starts off with vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Mm-hmm. It's not saying everything is meaningless. Mm-hmm. It's saying nothing lasts. Yeah. So it, that 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 word vanity there doesn't mean um, useless, meaningless. It's not saying it, you know. It's not sort of a, a you know staring into the abyss, gloomy kind of thing. It's saying if you're seeking to fill up all of the meaning in your life with things of this world, it's all going to come to naught. Yeah. But. It does talk about enjoying food, enjoying wine, enjoying the wife of your youth, taking advantage of your youth, enjoying your years, enjoying your work, make the most of it. All of that is happiness. As yeah. long as you look at it and go, this is a thing God has given me for right now, and I'm going to make the most of it. Yeah. And then when it's gone, it's gone. Yeah. And I will make the most of the next thing. Yeah. The public face of Christianity in the Western world is, is, you know, much of a prosperity gospel. You look at the Christian or so-called Christian best-selling authors in the local Christian bookshop or, you know, the most downloaded podcasts. These are people that are peddling the prosperity gospel who are saying it's always God's will for people to be healthy, wealthy and happy. How is how have we got into that place, Barnabas? And, and how do we need to protect ourselves from being led astray by teachers like that? Yeah, how we've gotten into that place is, um, I mean, I, I don't think this is anything new. No. I think it's just, you know, digital communication via via the internet, via television, via all of these things has just magnified it, I think. Yeah. You know, Paul warns against wolves coming in amongst the flock, false teachers, mm-hmm. which is what the prosperity gospel is. It's just peddling a falsehood. Yeah. And and it's you know Paul I love the phrase where he talks about the, the, people having their ears tickled yeah yeah that uh, that idea that's that's what it is there's just a a tickling of people's ears to tell them what they want to hear but not what they need to hear yeah nobody wants to be told you are a sinner mm-hmm. who cannot save him or herself mm-hmm. and you need a savior and that's where happiness lies on the other side of knowing that savior. Um, and so that's not what people say. They say, believe a little bit more, pray a little bit harder, donate a little bit more, and these blessings will heap up on you. And, and that, that makes a sort of logical sense to us because it feels like an investment. If I put $10 mm-hmm. in, I get $100 yeah. back kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. But just like you know, a Ponzi scheme, it's too good to be true. The return on that investment is, is going yeah. to overpromise and underdeliver. Yeah. Um, and so I think, yeah, I, th- I think it's, the, part of the reason that it's it's so compelling, though, is because it it does tickle the ears and it does scratch where we itch, at least initially. Mm. But if anybody pauses 
and just thinks, how does this stack up with what we see in the world? Yeah. How does the prosperity gospel speak to a global pandemic? Mm. How does it speak mm. to uh, cancer yeah. and broken marriages and you know infant mortality and these things that are heart wrenching? Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah. It, it fills none of those voids. So we have to just declare a gospel that says there's hope in the midst of this. And part of what you asked earlier, biblical happiness, I think biblical happiness can be had in the midst of pain. Yeah. Worldly happiness dissipates in the face of pain. It's one or the other, not both. Yeah. But biblical happiness, you can, you can be happy in the midst of pain because the, the truest best things are still there. We know that God is a giver of good gifts, even in the midst of suffering. Yeah. And so there, there's a, it's not just the kind of joy that says I, I have a foundation. It's also the kind of happiness that says I can laugh between the tears. Mm -hmm. And, and so there, I think that's the response that we need. That's the face that we need to put out there yeah. as Christians is, is not one of faux happiness. Yeah. Because that's not convincing. People see through that. Yeah. The world's, the world will will will, will see through a, a veneer very quickly. Yeah. But what they can't explain is people who are in the midst of difficulty, mm. who are still happy. Yeah. While not denying their pain, just saying, "I I hurt and I hurt and I have hope. I hurt I hurt and I can laugh." Mm. And that's that's attractive and confusing. Yeah. and compelling yeah how are we to experience happiness in this life while setting our minds on things above i think the key to that is gratitude mm. i think um if every time we enjoy something it's with an attitude of thankfulness our mind is on things above mm. setting our mind on things above does not mean sink thinking solely about theology, solely about heaven, solely about eternity. That's not even realistic. You won't accomplish anything if you, you know, you're not also balancing your budget and driving your kids to school and yeah. whatever. Yeah. But so it, it has to be something where when every time we experience something good, we think that's a gift. Yeah. That was from God. And I'm and I'm going to be thankful for for the happiness that it delivered. It delivered five minutes of happiness, or fifteen minutes of happiness, or a week of happiness, or a moment. And that was a gift. God gave that to me. So in the midst of this disastrous world, I have happiness. And and if we have that posture and stance of gratitude, our mind is on things above. Yeah. Because you can't be grateful without being grateful to someone. Yeah. You know. It's it's part of the reason the American holiday Thanksgiving is so confusing to me because yeah. most people celebrate Thanksgiving, <laughs> yeah. but they're not pausing to go, who am I thankful who, yeah, to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we're thankful to God, our mind is on things above, and and it and it, it more seamlessly fits together. How does you know the the delicious meal in this life mesh with those eternal thoughts of joy in the Lord? Yeah, yeah, so good. What advice would you have for someone that feels guilty over their happiness? I guess it depends on why there's a version of guilt over happiness because maybe they've been pursuing it wrong. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe they have been pursuing something that, that happiness or a version of happiness that is more idolatrous yeah. trying to fill up their meaning. And, and in that sense, I just say there, there's repentance, there's forgiveness, and then there's better happiness elsewhere. So they're not condemned they can leave that behind and just realize that they will not find it chasing that. Mm. But I think what I think the version of guilt you're talking about is more like the the Christian guilt mm. of, you know, I took too much pleasure in that temp, you know, in that in that temporal thing, mm. and uh, I need to kind of refocus and 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 focus only on things of God. And to that person, I would say, you missed the point. You know, when you were caught up in the majesty of that that concert or that album or that painting or whatever yeah. God was pleased because mm. he he invented that mm. he gave that to you and similar to what we were talking about earlier when we take joy in our children's joy when we give them things that is God now if we 
if my child took the book, failed to say thank you, and and never kind of acknowledged the source of that gift, mm. that that would be problematic. Mm. So again, that mm. there's an idolatrous aspect to that, but if we feel guilty for enjoying things, we've simply missed the fact that God really is happy when we enjoy the things that he provides for us. Mm. Is there hope for happiness when life is hard, Barnabas? Absolutely. Um, it, it doesn't always look the same. And when I say that, I don't mean, you know, the pasted on smile yeah. in the midst of misery. Yeah. It's like, I, I think I said earlier, there's this sort of laughter between the tears. So, to, to get personal for a moment, some years ago, uh, I went through a divorce, and it was it was really difficult. Yeah. Uh, you know, not not a thing that it wasn't a thing that I wanted. It wasn't a thing I was callous toward. Mm. But God and His goodness, it started me on this process of really understanding what it means to to find joy and pleasure and happiness in Him. So even through that time. There was very low times, and there was times when like s- smiles and laughter were not. <laughs> they were yeah. not on the table. It yeah. was not a thing that I was going to do. Yeah. But having a sense of humor, uh, being able to to appreciate and enjoy friendships and even laugh and, and, and really enjoy those times, intentionally seeking out things to be grateful for, mm. um, not, not losing appreciation for the good things in life, even though they – they they seemed a little bit more dull because mm. because that's what pain does it kind of it, it dulls enjoyment oftentimes mm. but there is happiness in the midst of that when when things have their proper place if i had looked to music or movies or alcohol or food or even friends to to solve my pain i would i would have found no happiness yeah but looking at those as signs of God's mercy in the midst of my pain yeah. gave me a, a, the ability to enjoy them. And yeah. I think that I think yeah. that is possible for anybody yeah. in the midst of suffering. Yeah, so good. What would you say to a Christian listening who has a natural personality to be anything other than happy? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think happiness is a personality trait, so they're probably okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Now, if you if you think I'm just naturally an angry person or I'm naturally a sad person, um, I think that there's probably some other things that need to be dealt with yeah. there. Whether it's and I don't mean to make light of this, it, mm-hmm. it might be issues of trauma, issues of mental health, things like that. But if you're just if somebody's like I'm just kind of a quiet, straight faced, even keel person, I'm not upbeat. Yeah. I don't think happiness is upbeat. I think of happiness in terms of enjoyment. Yeah. Um, and so, and that's why I say it's not a personality trait because people can very quietly be happy or very boisterously be happy yeah. or, you know, be happy in, in solitude or happy in a crowd. And, you know, there's, there's this, there's this whole array because God very intentionally made us uniquely different from one another. So I, I would say, you know, if you're, if you're predisposed to a really negative attitude of some kind, that that's some combination of you have some work to do with the Lord and also probably some some work to do with I don't know a counselor or something yeah um, some 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 more deep work to do if it's just a matter of man I just don't feel upbeat all the time okay do you feel thankful mm-hmm. are you intentionally seeking out those things where you go man God God provided this and God gave this and I see this opportunity for gratitude and this opportunity for enjoyment and, you know, I'm not going to expect too much of life, but neither am I going to ignore what God has given me in this life. And, and so happiness can come in all you know, kind of all shapes and sizes and personality types. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure we've all been in that place, Barnabas, where, you know, we've been getting ready to go to church on a Sunday morning and, you know, everything's going crazy. The kids have tipped cornflakes over each other and, you know, <laughs> the dog won't stop barking, having a nightmare. And we'll be driving to church. Everyone will be arguing. Yet we pull into the church car park and then all of a sudden everyone puts their, <laughs> their, their, their smile on. Is that a terrible thing to do? Should Christians fake being happy to be a better witness? Um. I think that's kind of two different questions. Is yeah. it a terrible thing to do? No, because 
the <laughs> the countenance we bring into a place affects other people. Yeah. So there is a sense in which by rolling into church, for example, or work, yeah, you you are you know you're either lifting or dragging other people down with your countenance. Yeah. Now I'm not saying we should be phony. I don't believe in phoniness. It's probably good to get in there. And when somebody says, how are you doing? If it's somebody you know well, to just say, actually, it's been a terrible morning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then talk, pray, whatever, kind of work your way out of it. Um, so in that sense, I think it, it can be a fine thing to kind of put on an appropriate face for the context for the sake of others, but then be honest yeah. about your struggles. In terms of Christians putting on a face to be a witness, um. Again, I think honesty is necessary there. So mm -hmm. as we grow in our understanding of how to find just appropriate enjoyment of the good things in this world, that also offs helps offset appropriate expressions of grief, of disappointment, of frustration, um, so that people can look at it and again see, I know you're in the midst of something difficult, but mm -hmm. also you seem to be really enjoying life simultaneously, really mm -hmm. grateful, really positive or whatever. Um, and that's a good thing. I don't I don't think our witness is ever improved by putting on a false front. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. Um if our hope is in Christ, ultimately, we don't need to put on a false yeah. face though, because we should always have this this foundation that keeps us from being yeah. just abjectly miserable we know sanctification is a lifelong process and along the way often a christian faces many trials how should a christian consider these trials um there's a there's a couple different things that come to mind about trials in, in kind of the way the bible depicts them yeah on the one hand you go back to genesis 3 and every trial is a result of things not being the way they're supposed to be mm things mm. being broken but not just things being broken because genesis 3 was not a passive thing it wasn't that the world broke and then it's just sort of been in decline but but that god cursed the world so it's there's an intentional disciplining of the world yeah. for sin yeah uh i mean so when when god curses adam and curses eve and curses the serpent he's not saying well I'm leaving. Good luck solving this mess. He's saying there's going to be an intentional disorder to this thing that that will cause pain mm -hmm. because as a consequence. Yeah. And and so on the one hand, trials should should be a perpetual reminder of our need for the day when Christ sets things right. The but there are other verses where God very intentionally says talks about I think Hebrews I don't remember which verse in Hebrews. It's in Hebrews somewhere. He talks about he talks about disciplining his children for the sake of their holiness and joy. Mm -hmm. So when you encounter trials, mm -hmm. remember that God disciplines like a father disciplines his son. Is is the the picture that it paints there? So there is there is pain for the sake of our building up. So a trial is not is not God beating us down or abandoning us, but rather walking us through something difficult for our betterment, the betterment of our faith, the betterment of our witness, uh, the betterment of, of our understanding of his presence, the betterment of our prayer life. It, it just, and then, and then a thousand other things that we can't see that he's doing yeah. at any given time. Yeah. And, and that's what he says. So we, 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 we don't get to define them otherwise. And if, you know, if our gut reaction to that is, well, it doesn't feel like that, you know, it, I used to play, I used to play sports. And when we had to, you know, do this awful physical training, yeah. it didn't feel like it was good for me either. But yeah. then come game time, you're prepared to play harder, run faster, go, you know, yeah. exert more effort than the opponent. And, and you're like, oh, it, it did pay off. There was a benefit. I am in great shape. So there's there's a touch of that in there as well. Yeah, yeah. You touched on this a little bit earlier on, but because you have a famous dad, did you feel an extra pressure growing up to always present yourself as positive and happy as you knew that so many, many more people would be watching you? Um, I knew that people expected it of me, but I'm also a contrarian, yeah. which means that <laughs> I, 
I, I tended to just kind of do what I wanted. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, I think putting always, always putting on a, a happy face would have been wrong and, and not the right way to do it. I yeah. was just wrong on the other side where I, I was kind of selfish in a different way. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, I felt the pressure. I knew people expected something of me, but I also just, I had no problem just sort of breaking the mold. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I think I, I often got that wrong, mm. but that contrarian bent is another thing that God has kind of used over time to help me get to the place of saying, I didn't, I didn't create you to be John Piper's son yeah. as your identity. I created you to be something else. Yeah. That's a piece of how you got here, but not, yeah. not the whole of who you are. Yeah. So uh, it's he's he's used it as a strength, but it was definitely a, a flaw in my character for a long time. I know you're on staff at Emmanuel Church in Nashville. Do you preach, and do you feel an extra pressure to be awesome if you do? Uh, I'm no, I'm not. I'm not one of our primary preachers. Uh, we have we have other pastors who are excellent, which I love because I just get to sit under their preaching. Yeah. I do teach some, yeah. you know, as in, in various class contexts and. I don't feel the pressure to be awesome because of who my dad is, because I realized very early on in life that I will never be able to do what he does. Yeah. And so it just, it's a little bit like, you know, if you go, if you go, uh, you know, you're, you're learning how to play the guitar and then like Eric Clapton sits down next to you. You just look at him and go, well, I can't do what he does. <laughs> yeah. So I'm fine. Yeah. Um, I, you don't feel like you're, you just you just don't even bother. Yeah. I feel a little bit like that when it comes to teaching because I look at my dad and go, oh, I can't do what he does, so I'm just going to kind of figure out how to do it in a way that works for me. Yeah, so good. I know you're um, a great person to follow on Twitter. Um, one of the funniest tweets I've ever read in my life, I guess this must be your brother-in-law, um, and I want to find out if this is true, and I don't know if you was there, Barnabas. There was a time when I think your brother-in-law had, was meeting your dad for the first time, and apparently... Your your dad was kicking him without realizing for, for, for the whole for the whole meal, but your brother in law didn't want to say anything about it because he was too polite. Is that true? Or was you there? I wasn't there. Um, <laughs> I I have every reason to believe that was true. It both. <laughs> it sounds like an entirely feasible scenario to me because uh, my dad is not always. Um, He's not much of a socialite, and yeah. he doesn't always lock in socially to kind of the to what's going on. So yeah, he, he probably just thought he was like kicking the leg of a table or something, <laughs> tapping his foot against it. But yeah, apparently he was kicking Matt in the shins repeatedly, which is yeah, it was a very it was a very very funny thread. Yeah, especially considering that you know Matt was already sweating bullets yeah. meeting his his future father in law, who is also John Piper. Yeah, so there was a lot going on. So good. Have you changed your theological position on anything over the years? Yes, but not in sort of a light switch way where it was like I used to believe this and now I don't yeah. as much as it's more like um, figuring out what things are worth emphasizing and what things are not. Yeah. What things did I used to have a very strong conviction about and now I hold a little bit more open-handedly saying, you know, I'm, I'm less sure about that than yeah. I used to be. Yeah. Uh, and just – for the listener's sake, I'm not talking about, you know, the deity of Christ or the authority of scripture. Yeah, I'm talking yeah. about, um, just, I, I grew up in a, in a church tradition and a theological tradition where systematic theology was, was very rigorously done. I think occasionally to a fault yeah. where very definite answers were given to things that I don't think the Bible presents so definitely. Yeah. Um, and so there's benefit in saying, I see this from scripture and I'm not really sure beyond that. Yeah. So there's, there's some of that, I think. So issues of, uh, like biblical complementarity is one. Mm. And I realize I might've just, you know, thrown a hand grenade into the middle of this podcast, but here <laughs> we go. Um, so I, I am complementarian in the church context. You know, I believe that the role of pastor and elder is yeah. reserved for men. Yeah. Uh, I think that's, that's biblically defensible. Uh, the Bible has some some very distinct things to say about the 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 husband as the head of the wife, mm. but I think the extrapolations of that in a lot of complementarian argumentation, including a lot of what my dad has said over the years, mm. is just that it's extrapolation, not biblically um, stated. Yeah, and so you know at twenty. 
I was an, like an aggressive complementarian to the point where I think I was even sinful in it oftentimes in my, the way that it, it, it put me in a position to think more lowly of women than I should have. Mm. And that has changed dramatically over the years to the point where I look at this and I say, just my, my view of my view of, of that issue, but then of humanity, mm. meaning just the image bearing, the giftedness, the quality of male and female is a different understanding. And so those, those issues are ones of, of God's order, mm. not of value, not a statement of to, to be demeaning those, those kinds of things. So that's an example. Um, but yeah, no, I, I can't think of anything that I used to believe that I just say, I no longer believe that as much as I've, I've shifted in either how I express yeah. it, yeah. the fervor with which I hold it or the the kind of where I prioritize it like what hill am I going to die on yeah. that yeah. you know that I or that I used to be willing to fight over and I'm just not anymore yeah well thank you so much for giving me an amazing title for this video Barnabas <laughs> <laughs> of course which I'm... one the, the hand grenade <laughs> yeah I'm completely joking what are some of your favorite resources that you've that have helped you grow in your faith yeah that is uh that's a hard question to answer because I feel like God has put resources in my way as I have needed them. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, kind of that perfect intersection of book yeah. and where my soul is at different points, but a few that stand out, um, Tim Keller's book, counterfeit gods yeah. played a real, real important role in helping me get my heart and life rightly ordered probably 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, uh, Paul Tripp's book, Whiter Than Snow. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's I think it's fifty two reflections on Psalm fifty one. Yeah, was profound in helping me understand having a right heart before the Lord, confessing yeah. repentance, being purified. Um, a long obedience in the same direction by Eugene Peterson. Yeah, is a it, it, it's a really remarkable book. Um. Ragamuffin Gospel by Brennan Manning comes to mind as yeah, well. Yeah. Um, and then uh, A Grief Observed and A Severe Mercy. So A Grief Observed by C.S. Lewis and A Severe Mercy by Sheldon Van Auken mm. um, are ones that – it's it's funny. They, they spoke into my understanding of happiness because they dealt with pain so yeah. well. Yeah. They were just so frankly honest about dealing with suffering, dealing with pain in a way that honors the Lord. Yeah. Um, so I'd say those those are ones that stand out in my mind as at various points that these these are ones that God used to shape how I believe, how I think. Barnabas, earlier on you mentioned your podcast. Um, tell tell the people about that, and also mention where people can get in touch with you on social media as well. Absolutely. So the podcast is called The Happy Rant. I co-host it and have for about six or seven years with Ted Cluck and Ronnie Martin, uh, two good friends and just brilliant guys as well. Yeah. Um, they, uh, it's We basically look at anything from the church to culture to just kind of other media from a uh, from in an effort to not take ourselves so seriously. Yeah. So uh, a lot of Christian thinking is very sort of ponderous yeah. and occasionally self-righteous yeah. <laughs> and takes itself very seriously. And uh, we, we don't, yeah. we're very tongue in cheek. We try to be thoughtful, but also funny. Yeah. And so that's kind of the gist of it. It's called the happy rant. You can find it wherever you, yeah. know, you get your podcasts. Yeah. Um, and then people can find me. I have a website, BarnabasPiper.com, which is where you can find books. You can find the happy rant there. Um, I occasionally post articles and then I'm on Twitter at Barnabas Piper and you can find me on Instagram or Facebook as well. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to get all of those links um, for the podcast, Happy Rant, your website and the social media um, links as well, all in the description below so you can follow Barnabas. Barnabas, thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed speaking to you today. It has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Barnabas.